Dr. Jim Clark. Um, and today's shelter series is going to be more of a conversation uh, than a presentation. Uh, but we'll be talking about the past, the present, and the future of Oakley Grove, which is a historic antebellum plantation house and property near Vaughan in Warren County, protected by Preservation North Carolina. The historic tobacco plantation consists of a federal style home built around 1800 for John Falcon and his family. And the image of the house most are familiar with is actually of the later 1859 Italianate Gothic edition attributed to builder Jacob Holt and built for Marianne Brown, who was the eldest daughter of John Falcon. Um, and this was built after the death of her husband, Dr. Lafayette Brown. Uh, Marianne grew the estate to nearly 4,000 acres with the majority of the family's wealth held in land, crops, and enslaved people. Warren County's Planner Society relied on the production of tobacco a labor-intensive crop, which was dependent on enslaved labor. And in 1860, 60% 60 of Warren County's population was enslaved. One of those enslaved at Oakley Grove was Byron C. Brown, who was the son of an enslaved cook named Lucinda Fane. And Byron is the great, great, or the great grandfather of Patrick Brown, who's with us today. Um, and he became a sharecropper at the end of the Civil War, establishing himself as a first-generation farmer who owned a business, grew commodity crops, uh, timber and raise livestock until he passed away in 1931. So Patrick Brown, who's with us, grew up on his family farm as the fourth generation uh, farming on land that his family has owned for generations in a small community called Hex Grove in southeastern Warren County. Patrick graduated from Fayetteville State University and has since traveled all over the world as a federal contractor and employee working alongside the USDA and other government intelligence agencies as an agriculture advisor while also managing Brown family farms, which you'll hear more about later. Patrick is intent on helping other farm farmers, especially black indigenous people of color by teaching future farmers of America how to start farming operations and to learn how to utilize their land for the good of the soil and atmosphere, planting and harvesting projects that are regenerative, sustainable, environmentally friendly and healthy for human consumption. In 2021, he purchased Oakley Grove, which he hopes to use as a tool to motivate others to learn about their own history. Dr. Jim Clark is a native of Vaughan in Warren County. As a farm boy, he worked the land at Oakley Grove with his family, growing and harvesting wheat and tobacco. The wheat and tobacco were actually stored and prepared for market in the front rooms of the once stately plantation house. Jim graduated from Littleton High School, UNC Chapel Hill, and Duke University. He spent his career as an English professor and humanities extension director at North Carolina State University as a literary historian and humanities scholar. His book about the area where Oakley Grove is located is entitled Finding and Keeping Vaughn, North Carolina, Our Hometown. And a link to that book um, as a PDF and as a, um, an ebook is actually linked in the follow-up email after this presentation if you wanna read more. Um, so that was a lot that I just uh, went into, um, and the intertwined stories of the Browns and their history as it ties to this property, both to the physical house and to the land, is often hard to follow at times, I admit. Um, so I wanted to start with a film which was produced by Patagonia last year um, that tells a little of the history more eloquently than I ever could, and it will introduce you a little more to the hopes and the dreams that Patrick has for the property. I'm gonna pull that up real quick. So as I said, much more eloquently than I could ever, um, ever, ever share. But um, I guess just to get things started, I know um, you kind of closed that video, um, Patrick, talking a little bit about your hopes for uh, for Oakley Grove in the future and the plantation and how you, um, I know you shared with me that you want uh, the site to be a place um, for, uh, to motivate others to research their own history and learn more about their history. Do you want to start just by talking a little bit about how you um, learned more about your history and how you kind of dove into the world of ancestry and tracking down um, your your story? Yes. Yeah, so as a child, um, 
growing up in my mother and my father's house, we were always um, uh, able to have history written that was passed on from different generations. And in our family, we had a family historian. His name was Carlton Brown, and he was located in Montclair, uh, New Jersey. And Carlton, uh, through his ancestral knowledge and uh, ge genealogy knowledge and history and research, he was able to pass down a lot of the information throughout the annual family reunions that we had been accustomed to having since 1981. Uh, my father, the late Reverend Dr. A.A. Brown, he was a member of the committee that put that family reunion together along with Minerva Brown, Carlton Brown, and all the, uh, of those elders in our family were descendants, direct descendants of Byron, who uh, uh, came, originated from the Oakley Grove Plantation. So what we're trying to do as the fourth generation, fifth and sixth, is just, you know, pick up where those elders left off and take that information and the heed to the history and pass that history down to the younger generation because it's so important. And they saw that it was important for them to do that. And we're uh, doing the same thing. Um, mostly all of those original members that were on those committees for those family gatherings have all passed on now, uh, to include my dad who passed on away last week. Last week. Um, and it's so important that we have that information to pass down. And to go one step ahead of that, now that we actually have a piece of history uh, being the actual architectural piece of the house where, you know, those, uh, that time originated from, it gives us an opportunity to utilize that space as a place to motivate other people to want to learn their history. And not only that, taking it one step further, creating an agro-tourism venture that can coexist with our farming operation that we have at Brown Family Farms in the Hex Grove community. Um, so on that property, we want to, once it's fully renovated, be able to host um, uh, future Farmer America seminars where the young institutions can utilize the property for vocational education, for agriculture, uh, to that would incorporate tours and understanding the business that a farm can generate outside of just row crop farming or grain production that people are so accustomed to having. Um, especially in the public school system right now. When I was in the public school system, we were very fortunate to have vocational education that focuses on agriculture and other things like marketing, uh, welding, auto mechanics, and things like that. Right now, our public school system is suffering from not having some of those programs. Um, trades are just as important as, you know, four-year uh, uh, educational institutions for graduate studies. Um, so our farm is more so of a hands-on farm where we offer volunteer assistance on the weekends to young kids to keep them more motivated and not just idle at home when they're not in school. So that property would just give another location that's closer to that side of Warren County to offer that assistance. And then we want to be able to also host events like weddings and possibly bed and breakfast and uh, every aspect of that house we want to make it where it's a storytelling opportunity you know um, every feature of that property you know not just the uh, descendants of Byron but also the descendants of John Falcon Mary Ann Falcon Jacob Falcon as well and also hit on the piece of how agriculture was so important to Vaughn and the history of Vaughn and why it was called Brown's turnout and reference back to some of the uh, documents that Mr. Clark was able to write about uh, that I, ha I, actually, I actually had no idea until I read his book. I didn't realize how important the Vaughn community was to Warren County. And a lot of that history is not being told. And uh, thanks to people like him and uh, future trend setters of um, people like me and potentially motivating others, we'll continue to carry that history from generation to generation. Great, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and we did, we did have a question pop in. Um, someone that wants to connect with you to see if there, there might be a, a relation there. Um, and I know you're active on Ancestry, so we'll definitely make sure that people get that connection. But um, 
kind of on a similar line of that, um, going back to Byron and kind of the history and um, how important Vaughn was to the whole Warren County um, area. I don't know, Jim, if you want to speak more to kind of the history of um, of the Browns and um, and as they relate to the property and Vaughn in general. The Browns were Vaughn, black and white, with an E and without an E. And until about 1880, when a post office and a store and a siding bigger than the one that had been established in the early 1850s came about, Vaughn was busy digesting and dividing up the land that the Brown brothers, Jacob and Ridley, had accumulated. Their mother was long lived. She died in the early 19, I mean, early 1880s, the same week that uh, her youngest child and her local brother, Jacob, died. And Dr. Ridley Brown, who lived in Vaughan, was forced to settle estate matters for the rest of his life, and he was dead before 1890. But a feature of what Patrick has told us today that really must be a coincidence, but it's rich, is that the white brown, <clears throat> the white brown family included North Carolina's first public school director of vocational agriculture. Mr. T.E. Brown, who was from Eastern North Carolina, headed initially what we would today call 4-H clubs. And he left that position around World War I to become the director of vocational agriculture in North Carolina public schools. And when Patrick mentions demonstration farming and FFA and things like that, it's in his blood, whether he knows it or not. I've written two histories of 4-H extension youth development in North Carolina. And in both of these books, I spend a lot of time talking about Patrick's white and black ancestors. It, it, it comes around in a beautiful symmetry that I think must be coincidental. Well, and speak it so I know historically the uh, the land was farmed for tobacco and then did it switch to cotton after the Civil War and then go back to tobacco. Can you speak a little bit, Patrick, to the history of what has actually been farmed on that land? And also, I know the land has been uh, divided and go was uh, with different family members over time and you've kind of acquired some of it back. But um like how large was that originally? How much of it now um, is under the Brown family farm and what, what are the plans for that? So currently um, I can only speak to the uh, second and third and fourth generation. Uh, my grandfather Grover, um, when he was willed the portion of land from Byron, his father uh, in 1931, it was 165 acres and a monetary amount of cash and all the uh, business ventures that Byron had owned at the time, which were two convenience stores and a hotel, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and my grand, great grandfather Grover, I'm sorry, my grandfather Grover, he uh, had a peach orchard is what he, he farmed and livestock. And that was up until 1971. So he was uh, a, um, a steward for that land on that side of Warren County, which was the Shocker community. And then that land was wheeled down to my father, Reverend Dr. A. Brown, where he farmed or in, was introduced to row crop farming, which is tobacco, grain, and then he had some livestock. And then today we farm produce, industrial hemp, and soybean is what we farm today. Now on, on the Oakley Grove side, which is Lilton, Vaughn community, that side of Warren County was known for cotton, peanuts, and tobacco. Um, it is still being farmed cotton around the plantation that I do not own. I just own 
a certain portion of land that that sits where the plantation actually sits. Um, but all I see in that area right now is cotton, um, not too much tobacco or anything like that. I think uh, Mr. Clark may uh, be able to tell you more about some of the crops that were being grown during the time that Mary Ann Brown and Falcon Brown and Ridley Brown were alive. In the 1850s, Mary Ann Brown and her children became wealthy, wealthy tobacco people based on slave labor and the land that they had acquired. And that lasted until her death in the early 1880s. They just continued to do some farming, but not the bulk of farming that had been possible when slavery was still in force. Uh, I've recorded in the book that I wrote about the area, the amount of money that came to the male and female members of the Brown family who were white. And uh, it's incredible to think that among those people, the daughter who married a doctor over in the Shaka part of the county honeymooned in Cuba. They were wealthy enough not only to have revamped the Oakley Grove Federal House into the plantation house that it became, but they had money after the wedding for which the redesign of the house was done in part to go on a month long train and steamer trip to Cuba for a honeymoon. And they came back to Warren County and Lucy, the new Mrs. Dr. Eaton, went over to live in the Shaka community, which is in the general area where Byron's mother and her children went to live after the Civil War, and they could leave Oakley Grove as free men and women. And uh, so, Jim, in your book, you do... Um you do reference a letter uh, that one of Byron's sisters wrote. Um, and I, I know when we were talking right before this started um, that you both were saying that was one of the greatest sources of information about Byron and that whole part of the family. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I have copies of that letter and I should say that as I probably said to Patrick, but I mean eventually to hand to him to use in his development of the Oakley Grove archive, all such things upon which my book was based. But I have two copies of that letter, and um, it simply talks about the conditions in which Flora, who's the letter writer, and her brothers subsisted and thrived as they went from slavery to freedom. And some of the scenes are set at Oakley Grove, and the other scenes are set in the Shaco part of Warren County, near where Patrick grew up. Uh, Patrick has already mentioned the episode that happened in the woods when the Union soldiers came by and informed Byron and others that they were not slaves. And Byron actually left the farm and went and lived with these Union soldiers heading home north in their camp. And when they came back is when Mary Ann Brown told Lucinda, the mother, and all of them that they could, could go, they could leave. And they left and went toward Warrington and then out to live in the Shaco community. Eventually, Flora moved to Philadelphia where she married and from where she was sending this letter back to white relations in Warren County who had asked for a history of the black part of the family. And this is her picture now on the screen. But that letter is as unique and clear and frank a document as I've seen in all the research and writing I've ever done. I think in this book, it received its first publication. And I know there's reference in that letter um, as well as to how Byron was being um, kind of 
trained as an overseer and had keys to the different outbuildings um, and things like that. So it's really, it's a fascinating letter and it is published in Jim's book, um, which is linked in a follow-up email that you all will receive. Um, but we do, we have a question or comment from uh, Kyle Smith saying, I don't believe it to be so, but I would be so surprised if your ancestor Lafayette Brown is the same that married Jane Caldwell Brown of Rosedale Plantation in Charlotte. Also interesting, Lafayette of Rosedale has a great grandson named Carlton, presently in New York. Uh, congratulations on your journey and discoveries. I don't know if that rings any bells for um, either of you. I don't think I can make that connection except to say parenthetically that the Carlton Brown that Patrick has referred to as being so important in the beginning of their collecting information and having reunions. He and I have a correspondence, and so I have, I have numerous emails back and forth with this Carlton Brown that we know to be connected to Patrick's bloodline. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I want... I would love to hear you speak more to about Patrick. You've talked about it a little bit, but I know we've talked about um, your your plans for Oakley Grove as a historic site in the future and how the significance of the building and its history um, goes beyond the building itself, but that there's um, such a historic tie to the land itself and to the people that originally farmed the land. Um, and then the fact that you're a farmer as well and using environmentally like regenerative practices and everything. Um, just speak a little more, a bit more about too, like the future idea and like your motivations for um, putting a, a positive spin on um, what some would say is a pretty dark history. Yes, yeah, so growing up, um, we in, in, I would say um, the people of my descent, we always look at plantations as being scary and, and why would you want to do something like that or purchase on a place that has so much dark history where I myself understand and are educated enough to understand the sense of reality of why that side of history took place. We're not, um, we're not trying to celebrate it, but we're trying to pay homage to those that work so hard to have others benefit from their hard work. At this time, uh, during this generation, I want to make it be clear that we're trying to build positivity from the hard work that was that was done uh, from the enslaved, not just the enslaved descendants of Byron, but the additional families that were also enslaved at that property. Well, we're trying to pay homage to them as well as build upon positive energy to rehabilitate the property so that we can actually create ways and avenues for further education in agriculture. Um, it is very big that climate change is affecting everybody, um, whether we know it or not, or want to learn and understand it. So we wanna build a safe place where we can educate the young people that are getting into agronomy or agriculturalism to understand the practices that can be utilized in all facets of agriculture, not just what they are accustomed to seeing. I'm just creating a place that's safe to understand history as well as agricultural practices and to create a way of uh, escape from traditional classroom settings to expand mind and horizon on not only our ancestral history, but the actual hands-on agricultural approach. And renovating the property and starting it at a 2.5 acre plot can give people an additional uh, resource in their community of how that Vaughn community thrives so much to help build Warren County, to also include the railroad system, and how it connected there to be able to move goods and services out of the state. There's a lot of history that goes beyond just the actual property, but it's the connections of how and where it's located, how close it is to the interstate, how close it is to the Mason-Dixon line, and all those things that also help slaves be able to have a place that they could 
go and work and actually get compensated um, when they became free. Um, so it's just a central point. It's my short period of time during my lifestyle that I can actually say that I had an impact on it um, of trying to help um, during my time instead of just passing my time by. Um, I was very blessed to get the opportunity to purchase the property um, from the previ previous property owners. And I just want to make sure that I preserve it and preserve it based on the covenants of the Preservation Authority and to do good by the property during my lifetime so that when I pass it on to my children, they'll see the importance in it and they'll be able to do the same. Another feature of what Patrick is describing is important in, in two ways. In the property that Jacob and Ridley Brown and their mother Mary Ann owned and developed, up until the 1880s, two timber harvesting railroads were planted by the time of 1900, 1905. And one of those railroad cuts is within a hundred yards of the back of Oakley Grove. And the other railroad cut that went all the way into Franklin County near Lewisburg is a mile in front of Oakley Grove. And both of these railroads were harvesting timber that had grown up since slavery ended the agricultural bonanza of that area. So the, the timber harvest of the Greenleaf Johnson and Fosberg railroads based out of Norfolk, Virginia, thrived on the waste of the agricultural land that had been enriched, but slavery went away and there was no labor force to continue to use that land. It's, it's nice to see it come back in, in this responsible way in an era that's still beset with problems and we call it climate change, but it's fascinating to see how it could again regenerate itself in an important way. The other thing that's so inspiring about this initiative on Patrick's part is that I told you that one of his white ancestors became the first director of vocational agriculture in the state's public schools in North Carolina. An African-American ancestor who grew up in the part of Warren County where Patrick did, Mr. R. E. Jones, became the first black director of 4-H clubs in North Carolina and practiced his position from North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro. If you go to where Patrick grew up, you'll go up the road and there's Jones Chapel Church. And I've talked to Patrick about Mr. Jones. I don't remember how the Joneses and the Browns are connected, but it's the same bloodline. And Patrick is in that tradition. And Patrick, you have a question from um, Evelyn Coltman, um, wanting you to describe the house a little bit and um, offer some details about your plans for restoration of the house. So maybe um, if you could talk a little bit about what some of the, the big projects are that need to be done out there and um, and what your time frame is uh, for doing that, and that's also a good a good time for me to plug, um, which I'll put in the chat right now. That uh, Patrick does have a GoFundMe campaign um, that's live right now, and he uh, told me earlier this week that he's already started uh, to use some of those funds on some of the work at the at the property. So I just put that link in the chat if you uh, want to go there and make a contribution. Oh, and you're on mute. Thanks, Julianne, I appreciate that. Um, yes, we are um, raising funds to help benefit towards the renovation project. Um, we've started the renovation um, of the foundation of the property, um, which is original uh, brick. Um, the architect of, of the property, the original architect was Jacob Hope. And we're trying to renovate that property based on the architectural style of his um, of, of the way he built the home originally. 
and we're starting from the foundation of the property and we're heading up through the basement, through the first floor. Um, we want to add all the original um, porches and all the moldings and trims that are in the property. A lot of the original trims are still there. Um, and then we'll focus on adding uh, running water, electricity, septic tanks, bathrooms. We'll add a bathroom to the home because the original bathrooms are outside. Um, adding a kitchen to the property and making it a livable space based on the approved permits um, for the county and uh, according to the covenants that we are contracted to follow during the renovation process. Um, we have a time frame um, which is about three years to try to um, or earlier to try to complete the renovation of, of Oakley Grove. That's, those are our, are our plans. And we would like to also add the out uh, event center to the rear of the property um, as well, um, where we look to uh, host some educational courses um, that I mentioned before, and also host events for the property to learn more about the history and what took place um, during the original time periods of the property up until um, when it was purchased by myself. Great, thank you. And Patrick already knows this, but for the benefit of everyone else um, joining us, because Preservation North Carolina does hold uh, covenants on the property, um, those are uh, deed restrictions that basically run in perpetuity with the property, ensuring that Preservation North Carolina um, is a um, kind of an advisory. Uh, we're here to offer um, offer guidance. Uh, Kathleen, um, in our Piedmont, uh, Piedmont office, um, as there is a resource for Patrick throughout the entire renovation um, to offer advice and feedback um, and guidance on, um, on the restoration process from start to finish to make sure that it does follow um, historic standards. Um, so you can rest assured that, uh, that it will certainly, um, certainly be a, a great project. Um, we have another question from Terry. Um, asking, Warren County has a very active historical society. How will your efforts align or differ from the extensive outreach the historical society does? Mm. Um, historical societies uh, of Warren County, I'm not too familiar with the organizations. However, I understand that a lot of the properties that are there are uh, still standing that were built by Jacob Hope just as, uh, as Oakley Grove is. And we do have some very beautiful um, properties that have already been restored. And this property is pretty much no different than those when it comes to restoration. Um, following the covenants to the best of our ability, um, as you referenced with uh, the resource of Miss Kathleen Turner, it's our goal is to renovate the property into its original state um, as much as possible. Um, that's all I have. Great. Um, and so first I'll, I'll read a comment, uh, a comment from Emerson Foster saying, I know Patrick and I have a close family connection. In 1953, my maternal grandmother bought 24 and a half acres of land um, from B. So we have a little Byron Brown Jr. and his wife, Ella Towns Brown. So we have a little piece of this rich history in our family. Oh, from Byron Brown Jr. Yeah, okay. Byron. Well, thank you for sharing that Emerson. Um, and then we have another question. Um, and I don't know if Jim or Patrick, which one to direct this to, but at what point did the brown with the E and the brown without the E name difference take place? Are there occasions for the browns and browns, the E and without the E uh, to get together? Which I'll add on to that. Um, what, I know you mentioned um, that your plans for the future interpretation of the property go beyond uh, just Byron's family line. So what, um, what, if any, connection do you have with the other, uh, the descendants of the, um, the Marianne Brown family and then the other um, enslaved people that were um, at Oakley Grove? Do you know anything about, about them and have any connection with them? Yeah, so I've only personally met uh, a descendant of the Brown, Marianne Brown by the name of Mr. Uh, Raymond Keelan and his wife, um, Raymond is no longer alive, but he owned the property uh, 
from the pre he owned the property before the owner previously sold it to me. So he was like from 1982, I think, to like maybe 2000 and 2000 or 2001, something like that. I'm not sure. Um, Mr. Clark can probably correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he was the only one that I actually had met that was a descendant. Um, but I've heard about going to school with cousins of mine that were the white side of the Browns without me knowing that they were my relatives. And I actually visited the grave site where all of the white Browns that are related to me live. And I looked at some of the headstones and I have actually seen these people a lot without even knowing that they were my cousins. Um, and that property where the graveyard is used to be the original part of the Oakley Grove Plantation. Um, and um, where did the Brown start with the E and where, where did it, without the E, where did it start? I would say it started when Byron was born. He was the first, he was the oldest child of Lucinda Fain and Jacob Falcon Brown. Um, none of them had the E on the end, all of his siblings. They were all spelled B-R-O-W-N. Um, and he was born in 1851. Um, and I think that's when it started, when they separated, if I'm not mistaken. The Browns with the E, who are white, come out of Tidewater, Virginia, and they bring that into eastern North Carolina and into Warren County. Patrick is right so far as my research goes. I do know of one black brown who was killed in the war who's buried there in Vaughn and Arthur Brown is his name Patrick may want to talk about that but this Arthur Brown has an E on his name because his mother Mahalia insisted on it and she had been associated with Dr. Ridley Brown's family and lived in a house, part of which still stands just beyond the ruin of the Ridley Brown home. Yes, that's located right before the bridge on the right, right. hand side. Yes, I'm that's familiar right. with that home. My dad used to take me to that home when I was a child also. And I think Jacob Falcon's daughters lived in that home. Yeah. And their last names were, start with a P, I can't, is it? Do you recall what their last names were? They were Sharon's. Sharon's. There you go, Sharon. Yeah. There were three of them. They were, they were people that Jacob fathered on his white housekeeper, and he, unlike his denial of property to Byron and Byron's brothers and sister, he left the three white children fifty acres apiece and joint ownership in a home. And Ridley Brown went to court in Warrington to defend the right of those white girls to inherit that land. So Byron's father was Jacob, is that right? That's right. And did he, did he pass away before uh, the end of the Civil War? He died in the early 1880s, the same day, that same okay. week that his mother and youngest sister died. Okay, so he, he was still living um, once Byron and all of his siblings and Lucinda were emancipated and left the property, right? And it was after the war was over and Byron and others had left Oakley Grove that the Sharon woman moved into the home that Jacob lived in and he fathered at least three girls with her. And then he lived on and they died of a, a kind of typhoid epidemic that struck the family. And uh, he was, if you see a picture of these brown men who are white, the picture that you've shown today of Byron looks like those men. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, the question, is there a particular church that these Browns, the Browns without the E, um, are connected to? Is there any connection to the Roanoke Chapel or Elam's Chapel in Littleton? 
I'm not familiar with that. Um, I would not be able to answer that question. And I would say on the other side of the ledger, the white Browns were not worshipers of any significance in the bond community or in the community when it was just their holdings. They, to my knowledge, were not professing Christians or agnostics. They were concerned with other things. And an equally important point is that though, though Dr. Ridley Brown went to UNC and then to Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and came home in the early 1850s to practice medicine, he never practiced medicine except on the slave population that he had to keep healthy in order for the plantations to thrive until after the Civil War, and then he became a community doctor. But he devoted himself entirely as a plantation doctor. Interesting. Um, I don't know. Does anybody else have questions? You can throw them in the Q&A box. Um, but going back to, uh, I don't think you answered this, and maybe you, maybe you just don't, maybe you haven't figured this out, but do you know anything else about um, other uh, other individuals who were enslaved on Oakley Grove that were not associated with um, Lucinda and her family? Have you had any, like, have you found anything else or had connections to anyone else? I've seen a list of accountability as property. Um, of course, back then, people were property. And there were a long list of names. Now, I don't know if that property was willed to any of uh, Jacob's kids or anything, but that's how I would assume that there were other families that lived there and that were enslaved there. In the book that I've put together, there are several lists of Oakley Grove Black people who were leased or rented out on an annual basis. And I give their name and what they might have been skilled in doing and what the rental fee was. All of this comes from the records kept in the 1840s after Marianne Brown's husband, Lafayette Brown, died unexpectedly without a will. And that estate went unsettled from 1841 until 1884. She had to die before this thing could really be resolved and split up and spread around. And none of the <coughs> spreading around in 1884 went to any of the children that Jacob had fathered with Lucinda. Well, it sounds like uh, just one more research opportunity for uh, the future Oakley Grove Historic Site uh, Museum. Yeah. Um, two questions just came in. Um, so another one from Emerson. There's a Brown Brown's Baptist Church down the road from my maternal grandparents' home, and our home church, Greenwood Baptist, derives from the Browns. Are these white Browns? Brown's church on the road from Warrington to Henderson is a white church. My family is descended from that church. And to my knowledge, the Clarks and the <coughs> Browns are not connected genetically. But Browns at the community or crossroads of Axtell is a white church. It's a very old white Baptist church. Mm -hmm. And then another question uh, from Leslie um, asking, is Patrick's book published? Which I think, Leslie, you might be referring to Jim's book. Um, and it is published. Um, it's available online. You can download it free as a PDF or an EPUB, um, which is so that you can get it on like a Kindle. And I do have a link uh, to access and download that in a follow-up email that you'll receive. Um, so you can go and look at that. Um, but if there aren't any other questions, do either of you have any follow-up comments um, or things that you want to make sure that everyone knows or any last words? Well, I, I would say um, please get a copy of Jim's book. Um, I learned so much reading that book. I'm so glad that he was able to write it. 
and to include our family history in it, um, as well as all the other families that are in the Vaughn community, because it was quite a few, quite a, a few of um, pretty humorous stories um, that Jim put in the book as a child, being in a lot of the small corner convenience stores, country stores, that I thought was very fascinating, some of those stories that he had in the book. And um, if people feel um, the need to help us towards the renovation project, please um, help donate. Um, any, any amount of funds are, are good to help to go towards the preservation of that property. And we are going to renovate it based on the covenants um, of the North Carolina Preservation Authority. And I just thank everyone for attending the day and learning about our history. And uh, I just want to, I'm just grateful. Thank you. I'd like to add to his comment, my pledge already mentioned once that any research materials that I have here in this banker's box beside my computer, I offered to Patrick and he and I will meet at some time to go through it and let him understand that there are things here that while they may not be originals, have great weight in telling the story that he will want to tell eventually both agricultural and architecturally. Well, I look forward to visiting Oakley Grove um, sometime soon, even before it's uh, restored. Um, and again, I'll just direct everybody, this, there is a link uh, to Patrick's GoFundMe in the webinar chat. Um, and I don't think he mentioned this, but he also, as uh, the future plans for the site, the, it, it is all um, under the umbrella of a nonprofit. So there's a, a nonprofit behind this uh, organization. Um, so you know it's gonna be a great thing. Um, and I just want to say thank you to both of you for giving me the opportunity to kind of just sit down and have a conversation with you. I know uh, Patrick and I spoke about a year ago and it was like an hour and a half conversation because there's just so many questions that keep coming. Um, but it's also just a great opportunity to talk to somebody who looks at a historic site and has a personal connection to the historic site that goes beyond the building. Um, it's something that I think we all need to be cognizant of that there is uh, the whole, the historic site is more than just a building. There's the context that's tied to the landscape and a historic site has different significance to different people. Uh, so I appreciate Patrick giving us the opportunity to talk about this. Um, and for those that are uh, commenting that they join late, no problem. We are gonna record this. The recording will be up on the website uh, with all of our other shelter series. So you can uh, check there probably later this week and it'll be available. Um, and please do look at the upcoming shelter series that we have. Um, the one that's going to be in March next month is actually going to be with Michelle Lanier, uh, who's the director of North Carolina Historic Sites. And in honor of Women's, uh, Women's Month, um, it is going to be looking at the women and the land. So another one kind of connecting back to the land and the historic significance of landscapes. Uh, so I appreciate you all joining us uh, today and especially to Jim Clark and Patrick Brown. So thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.